Now what about if we found some really interesting pattern such as this in nature? And we wanted to understand how we might be able to model that in Rhino. Well, one thing to note is that in Grasshopper, um, it is possible to do something like this, but there might not necessarily be a collection of objects that have already been created for you to do so. So sometimes you actually have to create your own algorithm. You need to com compose your own um, uh, expression or function to use. Um, we're going to expand upon our sequence objects here and create a new value set called series. Now a series, if we go to File New, can be found under the same tab that we found the range, Sets, Sequence, Series. One thing to keep in mind is that the series, if you drop in a panel, functions slightly differently than a range. Take a moment to mouse over the inputs and see what they're asking for. Mouse over the icon and see what kind of information it passes you. One last thing to try is to right click on the icon and go down to help. The help menu is really great in Grasshopper. It will tell you a little bit, a little bit about each object as well as the kind of inputs it has and what is required and what you can expect to get as an output. So the series creates a sequence of numbers spaced according to a step value. Here you can see that if the step value is 1, the step size is 2, and we create three values, we'll start at 1, we'll move to 3, and end at 5. Bouncing over to Grasshopper, let's go ahead and drop in a slider. Does anybody know what slider type we would need to be able to define S, N, and C? What kind of values are we looking for each one of these inputs? Take a second and see if you can't figure that out. Here, first number in the series, notice the icon a hexagon 0 0.1. The first tab here, params, contains three sub, or uh, rather four submenus. Input objects, these are all the different objects you can use in Grasshopper to kind of create an interface. Utility, exactly that, utility objects. Primitives, in the case of 0 0.1 inside of a hexagon, represents a collection of double precision floating point numbers, aka numbers uh, that have a decimal place. The 7 is an integer or a whole number. So you can see that S is asking for a number. So we could start at 0 0.25 if we'd like, or 0 or 1. N is also asking for a number, and this is the step. So I'm going to copy and paste this guy down and plug this in. Now I'm going to set my slider to 0, so it starts at 0. It's stepping with one, at the, with 1 spacing between each one. But C asks for the number of values in the series. And if you notice, the icon represents an integer. So I'm going to copy and paste the slider down, double-click it, and set it to integer. This is num points. One at least, maybe 10, and as many as 200 and hit OK. When I connect this, you'll see that I can now slide my slider. The value will start at 0. It will step a value of 1. And it will end whenever we reach 162 values. 161 is the index because 0 is the first index. Now I'm just going to delete these two sliders because we actually don't need them. We're just going to be interfacing with the C input. Now, a function. A function is a relation that uniquely associates members of one set to members of another set. The functions that we were looking at before were x equals t, 
and y equals sine of t. That was if we were wanting to create a sine curve. Now, in the case of the phylotaxy growth sequence, x equals cosine of t times t. So the series here represents then t. I'll right click on this and call this t again. y will equal sine of t times t. So let's go ahead and go back to our vector menu. And we're going to go to point by x, y, and z. So if x equals the cosine of t times t, and we have t here, we need a way of being able to define that expression. Let's go back to math. We took a look at the trigonometry objects, cosine, sine. We even looked at some conversion objects, the golden ratio, and pi. This time we want to actually write our own. There's a handy drop-down called script and a really nice new object called expression. Let's drop this guy in and take a look at how he works. There's some nice functionality here. If you think about a, a function or an expression, there could be multiple variable inputs. You might have an x, y, z, w, etc. as variables in your equation. In this case, we have only one, t. If I right click on the input and change its name to x, you'll see that now this input is called t. If I zoom in, you'll see that you can add additional inputs or remove inputs by clicking the minus. In this case, we only care about having one input called t. Again, right clicking on the input name, you can change its name to t. If I double click the expression editor, just like the slider, it has a context menu. If I select the expression, I can type in the expression that we saw here in the presentation. Cosine t times t. One thing to note is that the variable t here is the same variable you need to use here. The expression relies upon you to designate in the correct capital case structure, or in this case, lower case structure, the name of the variable you'd like to use. We're using cosine of t times t. I'm going to hit OK, and you'll see that now our expression editor updates to look like this. Let's pause there for a moment and everyone take a second to make sure that you're able to rename the input to t and enter the expression cosine of t times t. One thing you'll notice is rather than this object being orange, it's red. Red means that it's actually broken or it has some sort of incorrect data. Right now, t doesn't really have any meaning. So cosine of t times t is throwing a red flag because it doesn't actually know what t is supposed to be. By inputting our sign, however, or rather our series, however, you'll see that the status of this object will update with new values coming out of R. x equals cosine of t times t. Who wants to take a, a guess at where the output of this object should go? Great. A number of you guys have already answered correctly. We're going to go to x. So then, 
if I were to copy and paste this down, what expression should I enter into this editor? Not cosine, but correct, sine. This will go into Y. And if you notice, just like that, we have this really beautiful pattern that starts to emerge. So the Philotaxy point collection is really quite interesting because if you notice here, the numbers that we're seeing actually represent the index values of the points. This can also be understood as the birth order or when the point was created within the growth sequence. A nice way to have a little bit better understanding of a point and where it exists within a list is by going over to the vector menu and taking a look at this really nice object called point list. The point list displays the order of a list of point coordinates. If I drop this object in and take my point output into P, we can start to see that it will output the index numbers, the connecting lines, and a specific font size to display. Let's jump over to the params menu and take a look into input one more time. If you notice in input, we have a number slider as well as a panel. Let's take a look at this really nice object called Boolean toggle. The Boolean toggle is really great. It just clicks true or false. It's like a light switch. I'm going to take this toggle and copy them and paste them down. I'll take one toggle into T and the other into L. This way I can toggle the lines on or off and the text on or off. To see the text, you might want to turn the preview off of your points. Here we can now see by zooming in, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? You can start to see the growth sequence. These Boolean toggles are great because they're giving us a switch to say yes or no. Turn on the text or turn it off. We've looked at the range object as well as the series object. Let's jump to sequence really quick and take a look at call pattern. So this object is also going to create a sequence. But the kind of sequence it's going to create is actually a pattern to remove objects. Let's grab from the params menu a panel. The panel is great because you can double click and say something like, Help me. Right? We're all going to need a little bit of that as we start to model. You can also specify something like 10 if you want to tell it how many times to divide. But you can also do something like this, true, false. And it will actually spit out commands. But in order to do this, double click one more time and turn the multi-line data off, the bottom left radio switch. We hit OK. You can see now, instead of a message, we actually have a list. True, false. The call pattern object wants you to give it a list, like a list of points. Then it wants you to give it a pattern, like true, false. 
In doing so, it creates a new list of points based on the pattern that you specify. If I get creative and I say true, false, false, you'll see I get a new pattern. This is actually my called list of points. If you notice, sometimes these labels have a little bit more description than something as simple as just saying line A or B. This will really help for the readability, usability, and continued functionality of your file as you return to it at later uh, points in time. Let's take a look at how we can do something really fun with these points. Let's go to Mesh, and we're going to go to Triangulation, and grab an object called Voronoi. If you'd like to know a little bit more about the Voronoi object, just do a quick little Google search for Voronoi, and you'll find an entry on MathWorld that'll be really helpful. For us right now, what we're going to do is just take this output of L into P. And you'll see here we'll have a really nice mesh tessellation calculated through the points that we used in our calling pattern. If I say true, true, false, you'll see that my pattern will update. You have an additional radius for the cells that you can play with. If you'd like, you can drop down another slider and change its value. Maybe it's upper to, say, 20. And increase this, and you'll see that it will start to radius or fill at the corners for you. So if I change this to, say, 40, I can now increase the slider and start to get more of an effect. By changing this to all true, we'll see all of our points. So false, none of our points and then get creative and try some different patterns. Remember, you can always turn the preview on and off of those numbers if you'd like to not see them. So not only sometimes will we have to create and start to navigate through lists, but a lot of times we actually want to reorganize the data. That's called sequence manipulation, and the call pattern is just one object of many objects that you can use to do just that. Remember a Boolean is a property of a statement being either true or false. Hey, do you want to see the lines? No. False. Do you want to see the text? Yes. True. Please display that. List calling is when we want to actually remove a specific item or sequence of items from a list using a repeating pattern. You can see how easy it is to begin to use a pattern such as this, true, true, false. I'll throw in one more false just for fun. And you can see your entire pattern update. In addition to using a simple pattern such as true and false, you can also search a list for certain properties. We're not going to touch on this today, but I'd like to draw your attention to a little bit of interesting functionality of an object called gates and, or a gate and dispatching. Both of these objects can be found in the list dropdown for dispatch. What it allows you to do is check for certain types of conditions. Now, in the example file that we gave you guys with the uh, webinar today, we have included this, so you can definitely reference it on your own time. But modulus, for instance, is a really nice function that you can use to search what is the remainder by division of a number. 
For instance, if I look at these numbers here, I know that I have, for each point, an index. If I were to take the index of a point and check to see if, let's say, you divide by 3, it equals 0, or you divide by 7 and it equals 0, you could use that pattern of trues and falses to create new patterns in the list of points. In this case, modulus 7, 11, 5, 6, 13, and 21 yield very different results. The nice thing about that is that you could actually check to see does it equal 0 when divided by 3, 5, or 11, for instance, and start to build up composite booleans that result in even more interesting patterns. Again, the Voronoi object was a really nice quick mesh object to begin to produce pattern out of your points.